Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime channel on the entire internet. First on the docket, an update on the Letitia Stalk matter. Second, a fight for Alexis Starkey's family. Third, a sign of the times, police being fired one week after a shooting. Fourth, you can't say it's kids just being kids. Fifth, why you must always be careful of online dating. And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. Thanks for watching. First, if you haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And as always, leave me a comment below about what we talk about here today. Now, tonight, that's right, it's Tuesday. What does that mean? It's Tuesday night live at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And then immediately following our live show, we will do our Patreon show. And our Patreon show, if you're a Patreon member, that's right, you are able to call in and we can have a conversation about whatever you would like to discuss. Could it be, what do you think the question of the day of, for the Magic 8-Ball should be? Or simply a question about me or the law? Become a Patreon member and we will answer all of those questions. Now let's get straight to the docket. An update on the Letitia Stauk matter. For those who don't recall, Letitia Stauk has been charged as it relates to the death of Gannon Stauk. When she was arrested, being returned from North Carolina, had a little incident in Kansas where maybe she tried to get out of her handcuffs or was able to and maybe scurried about, uh, tried to get away. She's also maybe charged for plotting an escape while she's been in the El Paso County Detention Facility in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Well, her attorneys raise the issue of competency. Once that issue is raised and the court believes that there's a good faith basis for it, and frankly, there's no reason to doubt that, the court has to stop and have a competency uh, evaluation done. The first evaluation came back and said that Letitia Stout was competent to proceed. The defense then said, we want to have a second competency evaluation done. There were some delays in that process for obvious reasons. It's called COVID, that's right. The jail wasn't allowing the doctor who's doing the competency evaluation to come in and see Letitia Stauk and be able to spend time with her. It takes time for a thorough evaluation to be done. Well, we can tell you, we have an update that there was a hearing held about a week ago, and uh, the defense anticipates that the report, the competency evaluation report, should be done on or about January 2nd of 2021. So it's just right around the corner. The court has set a status conference on January 19th of 2021 at 9 a.m. so that they can decide what's going to take place. A couple things are going to take place. First, if Letitia Stauk is found to be competent by the second evaluator, I think that horse has ridden off into the sunset. If, however, the evaluator comes back and the report says that she is not competent, guess what? We're going to have a hearing and it will be a battle of the experts and who will get to decide? That's right, the judge. So we will see what happens on January 19th. The court did state that if she comes back competent, they will set the matter for uh, any hearings that are available, preliminary hearings, and or a proof evident presumption great as it relates to bond. What the proof evident presumption great means is that if the court finds that the proof is evident and the presumption is great that she was involved in the homicide, that means that she will be held with no bond. We'll follow this and see how things go. Obviously, this is a case that's getting a little long in the tooth, but that's what happens when competency is raised. Next on the docket, Alexis Sharkey. That's right. She was the internet influencer who was found deceased on the side of a Houston road. 
No charges have been filed. In fact, we're still waiting on the autopsy and toxicology results. Now, it has come out that the husband of Alexis Sharkey, the one who she has complained to via third parties, and these third parties' friends have stated that uh, Alexis was, in fact, being abused and choked out by her husband, Tom Sharkey, that um, he wouldn't allow the family to uh, see her body or have it shipped back to Pennsylvania for a proper burial. What apparently took place was Mr. Sharkey seemed very uh, cooperative up front and then just kind of stopped communicating with the family. It took the family some two weeks for the medical examiner to change uh, the next of kin from her husband to her mother. Good reason why everyone should have a will so that if there's ever an issue like this, you know who can take care of those um, final plans that need to be uh, made. Now, obviously, Mr. Sharkey has not been named a suspect, and we will give him the um, obviously the presumption of innocence if he were, in fact, ever named as a suspect in this case. Right now, it doesn't seem like the police have a whole lot of information, obviously, to make any arrests whatsoever. Next on the docket, a sign of the times. Now, I have complained for years that there were obviously good police officers out there and that there were bad police officers. And the problem was that the good police officers defended the bad police officers to the end of the earth, thinking, well, if we let them get this one bad guy, guess what? They could be coming for us. My, how things have changed. A Columbus, Ohio public safety director has decided to terminate Columbus police officer Adam Coy after Coy shot and killed Andre Hill. Andre Hill happened to be black. On Monday morning, in the ruling, the public safety director, a Mr. Ned Pettis, wrote that, quote, known facts do not establish that this use of deadly force was objectively reasonable. Pettis said that Coy didn't try to de-escalate the situation before shooting Hill, who was in fact unarmed. After the shooting, Coy didn't render aid or ensure that others did. Coy also didn't activate his body camera while on the service call. Obviously, this is an administrative proceeding and not a criminal case. But these types of proceedings used to take years. And if the officer lost, then the Police Protective Association, the police union, whatever they're called in your particular jurisdiction, would appeal and literally 10 years, you could hear about an officer getting their job back 10 years later because they didn't follow some civil administrative rule for firing of public employees. Now how things have changed. Obviously, we weren't there. The general facts of this case were that Hill was shot on December 22nd after officers were dispatched to a non-emergency disturbance call from a neighbor who allegedly saw a man sitting in an SUV for an extended period of time running his car or turning his car on and off. Saw a man sitting in an SUV for an extended period of time turning his car on and off. Last time I heard, that is not a crime anywhere. You can sit in your car. Maybe you don't want to talk with the missus. Maybe you need a little time away from the kids. Maybe you just like sitting in your car, listening to a new radio. Who knows? But it's not a crime. And sometimes these busybody neighbors need to just mind their own damn business. Well, when the police arrived, Hill came out of the garage with a phone in his left hand and his right hand obscured. Coy then approached Hill and ordered that he show his hands and roll over before asking a colleagues if medics were called. Coy didn't administer aid, according to the footage that was in fact captured. No weapons were found at the scene, and none of the other responding officers had their cameras on until after Hill was shot. Isn't that convenient? You know, most jurisdictions require officers to hit the little button on their body cam anytime they're going to have an interaction with a member of the community. And if they're going to engage the member of the community, they should turn it on. And you'll see oftentimes on body cams, the footage starts, but there's no sound because the audio starts when the officer pushes the button, but it rewinds usually about 15 seconds. And it's always convenient how the officers just happen to forget on this particular day. You know what? That video had a 
gone the other way could have been some of the best evidence for the officer, perhaps. Now, in this particular situation, it doesn't quite seem like it. Seems like this officer maybe didn't have the nerves to hold fire until he actually saw a threat. A man coming out of the garage with a cell phone is not a threat. Needless to say, he's no longer a police officer, Mr. Coy, and he may, he may, could face criminal charges. Next on the docket, you can't say it's just kids being kids. Now, let's face it, the police these days have a lot less discretion when it comes to dealing with kids. If the police are called, they got to make a report. Somebody's got to get a ticket. Probably somebody's going to get charged. It wasn't like in the old days when you got pulled over by the police, maybe out riding your bike, maybe being in construction sites you shouldn't be at, that they would turn you over to your parents or they would give you a warning. Not so much any day. But this case is a case where you cannot say that it was just kids being kids. Police in Massachusetts have arrested four teenagers who said they threw bricks at passing cars, which severely injured one driver. The Worcester police first responded to a call of an assault with a brick on Sunday afternoon. Officers found a man with a very serious permanent injuries to his face. The 37-year-old man who was the victim said somebody threw a brick at his vehicle, which struck his windshield and hit him in the face. The man was taken to the hospital for his injuries and his condition is still unknown. While investigating the initial case, police received more calls about passengers of a red SUV chucking bricks at other cars in the area. Police discovered the SUV was stolen and an officer spotted it on the road. The SUV sped up once police started following it and eventually stopped, and two male occupants got out and fled on foot. Two female occupants stayed in the car. There were two boys, one age 15 and one 16, and also two young girls, 15 and 16, who were held in connection with the brick tossing. In total, the teens struck 19 cars with bricks. All four of them have been charged with aggravated assault and battery with a brick and five counts of assault with a dangerous weapon, the brick, mayhem, conspiracy, 19 counts of malicious damage to a motor vehicle, throwing a missile at a train or a bus and resisting arrest. The 16 year old was also charged with carrying brass knuckles unlawfully and carrying a dangerous weapon when arrested. Now it sounds like these kids were up to no good and you really can't say, oh, they were just being young kids being mischievous. Anyone knows if you're throwing bricks off a bridge and it's gonna hit a car, you could seriously injure someone or kill someone. So I know there's a big movement out there for teens. Oh, their brains aren't fully developed. Ooh, they, everybody needs to uh, not do anything bad to them and they just need some more counseling. Yeah, no, this is straightforward. Uh, this could have seriously injured someone. These kids need to be prosecuted. Now. When you engage in a conspiracy or you're a complicitor, you are guilty just like you threw those bricks. So if those young girls, we don't know if they threw them or didn't throw them, but guess what? They're guilty just like they had thrown the bricks themselves because they are a complicitor and or a co-conspirator. And once you form into that agreement or you aid, encourage, assist, or abet somebody in the commission of an offense, guess what? You're guilty just like you had done it yourself. Now, if you haven't done so, please go to crimetalksearch.com and sign up for a background subscription service. You will be happy that you did. And I think the next story we talk about will convince you why you should. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you sign up for this background subscription service, you pay a small fee, and then you can anonymously search as many people as you would like. All right, you're gonna get a report literally as you wait after millions of public records are searched, you're gonna get information about the person that you're searching, their entire social media history. You're gonna get a criminal history background, uh, property records, marital records, civil judgments. Oh, and by the way, if they just happen to be a registered sex offender, things you'd probably like to know before you get to know somebody, right? So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. Now listen to this the body of a missing 26-year-old Pennsylvania woman has been found in a wooded area and authorities were led to her body by the man accused of killing her. According to multiple reports, 
Harold D. Hallman III, 42, has been charged with homicide, kidnapping, and abuse of a corpse of killing, allegedly, Erica Scholes. Scholes had autism and she went missing on December 6. Police say they were able to link Hallman to Schultz through phone records. Hallman, who was married and was described by authorities as transient, met Schultz through a dating app called Meet Me. Schultz was reported missing after failing to show up for work. Investigators tracked Hallman to Michigan, where he was interviewed about Schultz. Police also put a GPS tracker on his vehicle, and according to the police reports, when he didn't show up for a second interview, they were able to track him down to Pennsylvania. He was detained Saturday after being found walking along the train tracks. According to police, Holman had slashed his own arms with a box cutter and allegedly told the authorities, I want to kill myself. He also allegedly said, I need to die for my sins. Now, the police alleged that Holman had told the police that he and Scholes had walked into the woods where he hit her about a dozen times with a mallet type hammer. Afterwards, he allegedly said he repeatedly stabbed her with a kitchen knife. At this point, obviously the detectives determined that they had determined probable cause and he was arrested. There is no motive at this point. Now, obviously Mr. Holman will get the presumption of innocence, but when you confess, certainly shows that there is proof evidence, presumption great, does it not? Now, if that doesn't scare you about online dating, I'm really not sure what would. But if you're going to do that, get a background search. So go to crimetalksearch.com. I'm telling you, it could save your life. Now, next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Our dumb criminal contestant of the day is Travis Holton. He was arrested in Florida on December 22nd. Why was he pulled over, you might ask? Yes, that's right. His license plate light was not illuminated. Didn't we talk about this just last week? If you're going to be committing crime, make sure all your tail lights work. Your license plate light illuminates so that the police have no reason to pull you over. You make sure you don't have any uh, tint on your window that's going to be too dark. Any reason for the police to pull you over. Well, guess what happened? This little traffic stop with a uh, no license plate illuminated turned into, hey, do you mind if we have our canine dog walk around your car? Guess what? The canine discovered the presence of drugs in the car. And what happened then? They asked Mr. Holton out of the car. They asked him to widen his stance just a little bit so that they could search Mr. Holton. You know, they like to get in there good and deep. And guess what happened? That's right. Two sandwich baggies fell out of his pants. Turns out those substances were two ounces of Molly, AKA amphetamines, weighing some 58.5 grams. Needless to say, Mr. Holton was arrested and charged with possession with intent to distribute amphetamines. Now there's a lot to be learned here from Mr. Holton and his conduct. First of all, the car, really? And having drugs on your person, not good, Mr. Holton. And when the cops see you drop out, like what do you expect your attorney to do with that? Not much, that's for sure. Now, obviously that was probably shoved in there and you're kind of hoping it wasn't gonna fall out. Now, some people, not trying to give advice, used to tie little baggies with strings to their appendages down there so that things wouldn't fall out when the police did their search. Anyway, Mr. Holton, you are a dumb criminal contestant of the day. Congratulations. But wait, there's more. Mr. Holton, if you are crowned the dumb criminal contestant of the week, that's right. I'm going to send you a mug. And it is a cool mug. It's a Crime Talk mug. Who doesn't want to wake up in the morning with a Crime Talk mug? Of course, everybody wants a Crime Talk mug. Whether it's a big can of Red Bull you're going to pour in there, maybe a big hot cup of Joe, it's always better with a Crime Talk mug. So hit the link below, order your mug. You'll be happy you did. All right, thanks for joining us today. Please join us this evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We will be going live on Facebook, YouTube as well at the same time.
modern technology. Go figure. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tonight on Crime Talk.